Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to have uh, welcome you here today to the fourth and final part of our LIR series on social media policy and the public good. Uh, it turned out that the topic has become even more urgently current since the three lectures we had in September. Uh, in the interim, we heard uh, whistleblower evidence with even more alarming shortcomings uh, about even uh, more alarming shortcomings at Facebook than our speakers had told us about. Today, however, we return to the legal aspects of free speech. The broad outlines of several issues were laid out by Professor Sarah Song in the first lecture in our series. Uh, today, to continue the discussion uh, after our postponement, we are very privileged to have as our speaker, the Dean of the Ber Berkeley Law, Erwin Chemerinsky, uh, who also holds the title of Jesse H. Chopper, Distinguished Professor of Law. Dean Chemerinsky received his BA from Northwestern University and went on to Harvard Law. After two years as an attorney in Washington, D.C., one in the Department of Justice, he began his distinguished career in legal education in 1980 as an assistant professor at DePaul University at Chicago uh, College of Law in Chicago. He came to California in 83 to take up a position at USC's law school, where he taught until 2004. After four years at Duke University, he returned to California as the founding dean of the new law school at UC Irvine. And in 2017, he was brought to Berkeley as Dean. Dean Chemerinsky is a renowned expert in constitutional law, especially with those aspects having to do with the rights of the individual. You can get a good idea of the range of his interests and expertise uh, if I recite the titles of uh, the most recent among his 14 books. Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights from 2021. The Religion Clauses, The Case for Separating Church and State, co-authored with Howard Gilman, 2020. We the People, a progressive reading of the Constitution for the 21st Century, 2018. Free Speech on Campus, 2017. Closing the Courthouse Door, How Your Constitutional Rights Become Unenforceable, 2017. Uh, there are many other uh, books and many articles up uh, naturally. The list of his honors and awards takes over a full page of his CV. And these recognize his service to legal education in general and judicial education in particular freedom of information, free speech, community service, and pro bono work, and many other things. I could go on, but it is better to welcome him now to speak to us on the changing Supreme Court and free speech. Dean Chemerinsky. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you for having me today. I think that in many ways, we have entered the golden age of free speech. It's not hyperbole to say that the internet and social media are the most important developments with regard to freedom of expression since the invention of the printing press centuries ago. If science fiction writers a few decades ago had tried to imagine a way in which to maximize speech in society, they couldn't have done better than the internet and social media. But every benefit comes with a cost Every positive invention has detriments, and certainly that's true with regard to the internet and social media. It makes it easy for people to reach a mass audience, and it might be with information that's desirable, or it might be with misinformation and falsity. It might be to spread information that enriches and uplifts us, but it might be to spread information that destroys reputation and harms us. It has the benefit that it doesn't respect national boundaries, but it also has the detriment that those in foreign countries then can exercise undue influence in our political process. Well, that's what I'd like to talk about this afternoon. I was told to talk for about 45 minutes, and take 30 minutes for questions. I wanna develop three points. First, I wanna explain why I believe that the internet and social media have created a golden age for free speech and acknowledge the harms that go along. Second, I wanna focus on section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which I believe really are the 23 words that made the internet and talk about the proposals, both from the left and the right to try to change section 230. And then third, I wanna focus on a particular issue with regard to social media and internet, and that's hate speech. I think one of the criticisms of the internet and social media is the way in which it makes it possible for hate speech to be widely transmitted 
and the harms that that causes within society. So after those points then, delighted to take questions you have about any of this, anything about free speech in the Supreme Court. Well, I started with what might have sounded like hyperbole, that we entered a golden age of free speech. Let me try to back up that conclusion and explain why the internet and social media are the most important developments for speech since the invention of the printing press. Let me point to three. First, it democratizes the ability to reach a mass audience. It used to be in order to reach a mass audience, somebody had to be rich enough to own a newspaper or to get a broadcast license. Now, anyone with a smartphone or even just access to a modem in a library can quickly reach a huge number of people. Or to put it another way, scarcity of media was always a problem into the internet and social media. Even when there used to be a large number of newspapers, still there were a finite number of newspapers, a finite amount of space that could be filled in the pages of those papers. The broadcast spectrum was inherently scarce. Back in 1969, in Red Lion Broadcasting for Federal Communication Commission, the Supreme Court upheld the fairness doctrine, including a right to reply law, is applied to over the air television and radio. The Supreme Court decision was unanimous and it stressed the inherent scarcity of the broadcast spectrum. But the reality of the internet and social media is that for the first time in history, there's not scarcity. There is no limit to the amount of space that can exist on the internet social media. And as a result, there is the ability of any of us to quickly reach a mass audience. I find one of the ironies now is that it is the unlimited nature of speech over the internet that's leading to calls for greater regulation. When it was just a half century ago in Red Lion, that it was the scarcity that led to calls for regulation. Now, as I alluded to in my introduction, the ability of anyone to reach a mass audience can have tremendous benefits. We're not dependent upon a few media owners to control what we see and hear, but there's a detriment. A couple of decades ago, a UCLA law professor, Eugene Volokh, wrote an article in the Yale Law Journal titled Cheap Speech. And in it, he talked about how the internet and social media were making it so easy so inexpensive for people to reach a mass audience. And he identified the costs of cheap speech. Of course, when he wrote that article, it was before things like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram that have only made it more so. So if the information is accurate and truthful, if it's useful to people, this is an enormous benefit, but it could also be that the information is false and inaccurate and thus can do enormous harms to people. As I said in my introduction, what if the speech, even if it's true, is harmful to somebody's reputation? We can have quick dissemination to the public of very private information. But I think overall, one of the characteristics of the internet that we have to accept is that it does democratize the ability to reach a mass audience. A second characteristic of the internet that's important is the accessibility of information for all of us. We have the libraries of the world, the museums of the world at our fingertips. My guess is that everybody who's on this call today has had a dinner conversation where there's an argument about something. In my house, it's usually about a, a sports statistic. And the easy answer is you take out your phone and you look it up. This is in terms of the underlying values of the First Amendment, a tremendous benefit. If what the First Amendment is about is access to information, we all have it. We have it like never before. Things you'd need to go to a library or museum to obtain. 
Now you can get instantaneously or your smartphone or your tablet or laptop. To put this another way, speech on the internet is much more permanently there than over any other media. Imagine before the internet and social media that a newspaper defamed somebody. I do not minimize the harms that could cause. The false information, injurious reputation could quickly be spread by word of mouth, maybe even picked up in other newspapers. But ultimately, after a relatively short period of time, if someone wanted to go and see that article, they'd have to go to a library and look it up on microfilm or microfiche. Now it's on the internet and it's basically there forever. It's extremely difficult to get anything permanently removed from the internet. Once it's begun to circulate, it is to be found in an almost infinite number of places. So if it's information we want to have permanently available, the internet is terrific. But if it's information we don't, because it's false, because it's harmful, because it's injurious reputation, because it invades privacy. Well, you see the harms being there too. A third characteristic of the internet that I think is so important is that it doesn't respect national boundaries. It transcends the usual lines between nations. When the revolution began in Egypt, the government there tried to cut off internet access for the people in the country. But quickly through satellite phones, they were able to access what was going on and what the reporting was, in what was going on in their country. Countries still try to cut off speech from outside, but the internet makes that enormously difficult to do. There's benefits to that, it makes it harder for any government to engage in censorship, but there's detriments to that as well. The United States Supreme Court has estimated that 40% of the pornographic material on the internet in the United States comes from other countries. It makes it very difficult, even if the government wanted to, try to control sexually explicit material over the internet. Also, it makes it quite easy for foreign countries to try to influence American elections. We saw that in the 2016 election. The Mueller report made clear that there was a systematic effort by those in Russia to influence the outcome of the election. And given how close it was, the influence might have been decisive. So I can talk about all of these benefits of the internet. I recognize the harms of the internet, but it's important to see that both the benefits and the harms come from the same basic attributes of the internet. It makes it so easy for anyone, for all of us to speak. It makes it so easy for any of us, all of us to access information at any point in time. Well, with that in mind, let me focus on the second part of my remarks, which look at section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. There's a book that came out about two years ago titled the 23 words that made the internet. He was referring to Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. Section 230 says that internet platforms cannot be held liable for that which is placed there. So if defamatory information is put on Facebook, Facebook can't be held liable. If information that invades privacy is put on Instagram, Instagram can't be held liable. The result of this is that the social media platforms could develop without fear of liability. And the way in which internet platforms are defined within section 230 is very expansive. And so long as the internet platform isn't generating the content, it can't be held liable. So long as it is simply what's placed there, the internet doesn't have to face liability. Section 230 speaks of interactive computer services as the operative phrase 
And that's everything from TikTok to when it existed, Yik Yak to Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to Snapchat and so much else. And Section 230 has been the subject of a great deal of criticism in recent years, criticism from both the left and the right. The right has criticized Section 230 as giving too much latitude to, to social media companies to take down speech. And they believe that this power is used to censor conservative speech. You might remember that President Trump vetoed a defense appropriation bill because he wanted Congress to change Section 230. And this was before social media platforms like Yik Yak, uh, like uh, Twitter and Facebook banned him for a period of time. On the other hand, liberals are also critical of Section 230. They believe that it has created a free-for-all where hate speech proliferates, where false information proliferates, where speech that's harmful to individuals goes on. A significant number of people, especially young women, have experienced harassment over social media. And all of this is blamed on Section 230. To this point, no one has come up with a satisfactory way of amending Section 230 that's likely to get bipartisan support. And so Section 230 remains in the form that it was when it was adopted in 1996. It's interesting to remember that when Section 230 was enacted in 1996, it was before there were things like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google and TikTok and the like. Well, let me talk a little bit about the challenges in trying to change Section 230. One thing to keep in mind is that the internet companies are all private companies. The social media companies are private companies and therefore they don't have to comply with the constitution. One of the most basic principles of constitutional law is that the Constitution in its protection of rights applies only to the government. Private conduct doesn't have to comply with the Constitution. A couple of easy examples. This was pointed out in the kind introduction. Before coming to the University of California, I was a professor at Duke Law School. Imagine while I was there that I had criticized the president of Duke University or I guess I should say if I again were to criticize the president of Duke University. If he had ordered me fired, I could not sue him or Duke University for violating my First Amendment rights. Since Duke is a private school, the First Amendment and the Constitution don't apply. Now, of course, I work at the University of California. If I were to give a speech criticizing the president of the University of California, and if he were to order me fired, I could not sue him. I could sue him and I could sue the university for violating my First Amendment rights. Dick, you're all my witnesses. If I got fired for my speech. I would sue for the constitutional violation. That's because this is a state university. Or my favorite example is a true story of a conversation I had with my oldest two children 29 years ago when we were in a grocery store together and they were nine and six at the time. Diet Coke was giving away free baseball cards. Three were pictured on the outside of the package. As we went up and down the aisles of the grocery store, my two sons were arguing, as they often did at that age, but who was gonna get the extra baseball card? Finally, I said, be quiet. I don't wanna hear anything else about baseball cards to leave the grocery store. My then nine-year-old turned to me and said, you can't tell me to be quiet. I've got freedom of speech. I was ready for him. I said, freedom of speech means the government can't tell you to be quiet. I'm not the government, so I can. To which he, without missing a beat, turned to me and said, well, you're like the government to me, so you shouldn't be able to tell me to be quiet. It's when I first knew that someday he was going to law school and be a lawyer. He's now a federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. My point of these stories though, is private companies even powerful ones, 
don't have to comply with the Constitution. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google don't have to comply with the Constitution. There's a lawsuit that's been filed by Donald Trump arguing that these social media platforms that have banned him, like Facebook and Twitter, do have to comply with the Constitution. But I'll tell you as a matter of constitutional law that that claim is frivolous. They are private. In the words of constitutional law, there is no state action, so they don't have to comply with the Constitution. A second characteristic that's important in thinking about the internet and social media is that government regulation of the internet and social media does have to meet the First Amendment. The social media companies, in what they do, doesn't have to comply with the First Amendment, but government regulation of social media companies does have to meet the First Amendment. Florida adopted a law just last spring that says that it's against the law in Florida for social media companies to censor or quote, deplatform. So if a social media company were to censor deplatform on the basis of the ideas, it would violate Florida law. Immediately a federal court declared this unconstitutional because it's the situation that government regulation of these private companies is something that implicates the First Amendment, just like government regulation of any private companies does. So Congress and its ability to regulate internet companies is very limited. Now, there have been proposals that have been introduced into Congress to try to impose more regulation on the internet, but I think that they are likely either to have First Amendment problems or real practical difficulties. I don't think that Congress can tell Facebook or Twitter or YouTube what to put up or what not to put up any more that it can do that with regard to the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, CNN, or the San Francisco Chronicle. One proposal that's gotten some traction is a bill that's called the PAC Act, it is bipartisan sponsorship. They would say if social media companies have notice that speech is there that meets certain criteria, then it will have to take it down or face liability. The problem with this is the sheer quantity of speech that goes on every minute, every day over social media. The most recent statistics that I could find were 2013, which is now eight years ago. So this is probably a fraction of what's there. But at that time, 350 million photos were put a day on Facebook. 4.75 billion items of information were placed a day on Facebook. Or put it another way, um, in the first quarter of this year, Twitter took down 5 million pieces of information um, in between 2015 and 2018, they took down 1.2 million pieces of information that was seen as supporting terrorism. If we said that social media companies were liable for any speech that was placed there, they would need to pre-screen everything before it was there. The quantity would be so enormous. And of course, they would want to avoid liability so they would err on the side of censorship. I think all of this is what makes reform of section 230 so very difficult. It's why liberals and conservatives have not been able to agree to any solution of what to do with regard to social media. It'll be interesting to see as efforts go forward with regard to section 230, is there a way of reforming it that would be able to get through Congress and be signed by the president? Is there a solution that's better than the disease that it's trying to cure? But that's what Section 230 is about. It's protection of the internet and social media for being liable for that which is just posted there. Well, the third and final part of remarks focus on hate speech. And I think among the most powerful criticisms 
of expression of the internet and social media is the prevalence of hateful expression. The law in the United States under the First Amendment is different from that that exists, at least in most Western nations. The United States provides far more protection for hateful speech than any other Western nation. Why is that? And should it be that way? Let me be clear that the law is well established that hateful speech is protected by the First Amendment. The Supreme Court cases on this are clear. There's an earlier case in 1992, RAV versus City of St. Paul. St. Paul, Minnesota adopted an ordinance prohibiting burning a cross or painting a swastika in a manner likely to anger, alarm, or cause resentment. Burning a cross, painting a swastika are ugly symbols of hate but the Supreme Court unanimously declared the law unconstitutional. The Supreme Court was explicit that even a hateful speech like this is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, about a decade later, in 2003, the Supreme Court decided Virginia versus Black. It involved a Virginia law that prohibited cross burning. The Supreme Court in an eight to one decision declared this unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said in an opinion by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor that burning a cross is speech protected by the First Amendment unless it can be proven in the particular case that it's done with the intent to threaten. Or just a few years ago, there was the Supreme Court decision, Mattel versus Tan. It involved a dance rock group out of Portland, Oregon. All of its members were Chinese American and they decided to call themselves the slants. Slants is a term that's often used in a disparaging way towards Asians. They said that they wanted to use this because they wanted to appropriate back to the Asian community what had been a disparaging term. They liken this to how the word queer had been thought of as derogatory to gays and lesbians, and then was appropriated back and used by gays and lesbians to describe themselves. They went to register the trademark, the name of their band, and under the federal law concerning trademarks, none could be registered if they were disparaging to any person or group. This is how the Patent and Trademark Office for a time refused to trademark the then football team's name, the Washington Redskins, because it's seen as a name that's disparaging to Native Americans. And they refused to trademark the name Slants because it's disparaging to Asians. The Supreme Court unanimously declared unconstitutional this provision of the Lanham Act. The Supreme Court said and said explicitly that the government can't prohibit speech create civil liability for speech, deny benefits for speech like a trademark just because the speech is offensive, even if it's deeply offensive. Now, this isn't to say that there's no limits on speech. If speech rises to the level of a true threat that causes a person to reasonably fear for his safety, or speech rises to the level of harassment, speech that interferes with a person's employment or educational opportunities, or speech is inciting of illegal activity under a very specific definition for incitement, the speech can be punished. But speech cannot be prohibited, cannot be the basis for liability, just because it's hateful. I'm often asked, where is the line between free speech and hate speech? And my answer inevitably is, that's a false distinction because under First Amendment law, hate speech is protected as free speech. Why is this? Why is the United States so much the outlier in this regard? I think there's several things that explain this. One is the difficulty of defining what's hate speech in a manner that's not 
unduly vague or overbroad. The Supreme Court has been clear that any law that regulates speech must be clear about what's protected and what's allowed. It can't be too vague. It can't regulate substantially more speech than it needs to to accomplish its purpose. No one has yet found a way of defining what's hate speech so that it's not unduly vague or overbroad. In the early 1990s, over 350 college universities adopted so-called hate speech codes. Everyone to be challenged in court without exception was declared unconstitutional. Almost always they were declared unconstitutional on vagueness and overbreath grounds. As an example, after a series of ugly racist incidents, the University of Michigan adopted a hate speech code. It prohibited speech that disparaged on the basis of race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. So it could not be speech that would disparage people on account of their race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. But what does it mean to disparage? Or another word that was used in the law, what does it mean to stigmatize? I should note that that's what the European laws are often written as. You can't have speech that stigmatizes or demeans on the basis of race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. But what do we mean by disparage or stigmatize? One of the challengers in the University of Michigan lawsuit, it's called Doe versus University of Michigan, was a sociobiology graduate student who was doing research on whether there's inherent behavioral differences between men and women. And he said he was afraid that depending on the findings of his research, he might be seen as disparaging on the basis of sex. Others who were doing research in terms of race, sex, religion, sex orientation, were part of the lawsuit challenging this. And the federal district court found that the Michigan hate speech code was unconstitutionally vague and overbroad. This is the same thing that happened with so many other speech codes around the country. When I was at the University of California, Irvine, I co-taught an undergraduate seminar on free speech on campus. And one of the exercises that we asked of our students was to try and draft a hate speech code and to try to do so in a way that wouldn't be unduly vague or overbroad. Our students found it to be not just challenging, but probably an insurmountable task. How can we define what's so hateful that it can be prohibited and be sufficiently clear that it's not vague, that it's not overbroad? I think there's another reason why hate speech is protected in the United States, and that's that the experience under hate speech laws has shown us that it's so often used against the very people we desire to protect. Between the time the University of Michigan adopted its hate speech code and the time that it was struck down, every enforcement action under it was brought against African-American and Latinx students. 100% of the enforcement actions were brought against the very groups that the hate speech code was most seeking to protect. This has been the experience in Europe as well. When England adopted its first hate speech law, the initial prosecution under it was against a Zionist group. The prosecutor felt that Zionism should be regarded as a form of racism, and those who advocated it were therefore engaged in hate speech. In France, there's a hate speech law. Probably the person who's been prosecuted under it the most is the actress Bridget Bardot. She's an animal rights activist. And she's spoken out often, frequently, forcefully against the use of animals in religious rituals and has then got prosecuted under the hate speech law. But I think most of all, hate speech is protected because it's an idea. And under the First Amendment, all ideas, even offensive ones, can be expressed. We saw this in another Supreme Court case a little less than a decade ago. 
Snyder versus Phelps. Snyder versus Phelps involved a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church. They make it a practice of going to funerals of those who died in military service and use them as the occasion for expressing a vile anti-gay, anti-lesbian message. Matthew Snyder was a Marine who died in military service in Iraq. The members of the Westboro Baptist Church went to his funeral in Maryland. Before the funeral began, they asked where they could stand. Police officers pointed to a place about a thousand feet away from where the ceremony was gonna be held. Before the funeral ceremony, they chanted and sang. During the funeral, they were silent but held up signs. That night, Matthew's father, Albert, was watching the news. He was able to read the signs. He was deeply upset by the content and he sued the members of the Westboro Baptist Church for invasion of privacy and for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The Supreme Court in an eight to one decision ruled in favor of the members of the Westboro Baptist Church and against Albert Snyder. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, it was clear that though the speech was deeply offensive, it was protected by the First Amendment. Therefore, it could not be a basis for liability. And I think that hate speech is protected under the First Amendment precisely because it identifies an idea, albeit an offensive one. None of this is to minimize the harms of hate speech. Hate speech campus, hate speech over the internet, hate speech over social media. If free speech had no effect, it wouldn't be protected as a fundamental right. Speech is protected precisely because it can have such impact. Well, the effects can be positive or the effects can be negative. Speech can enlighten and uplift or it can wound terribly. Constitutional scholars, like Charles Lawrence and Mari Matsuda and Rich Delgado, have talked eloquently and powerfully about the harms of hate speech. And yet what courts in the United States have said is giving the government the power to punish, to hold liable speech is much worse than allowing the hate speech to go on. And that's why hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. I have seen over the 42 years that I've been a law professor, changes in my students' attitudes with regard to speech, including with regard to hate speech. I think now more of my students would disagree with the Supreme Court and its protection of hate speech, certainly than there were when I started teaching back in 1980. I've seen this on campus in so many different ways. You might remember in 2017, a campus group called the Patriots was coming to speak on, they were organizing a series of speakers on campus. They said there was gonna be a week in September where they were gonna be inviting Milo Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro and Ann Coulter and Charles Murray. And Chancellor Carol Christ convened a forum to a large auditorium on campus to discuss speech on campus. And one of the panelists, very powerfully said that one of the largest problems in the United States today is white supremacy. And the chancellor should exclude white supremacist speakers from coming onto campus. And there was huge applause. Then during the question and answer period, a student very eloquently said that she feels threatened when there's speakers that are hateful on campus. That she wants the chancellor to stand up for the students and exclude those speakers that are hateful, regardless of what the First Amendment, regardless of what the courts say. And there was huge applause for the student when she finished. I was a member of the panel that the chancellor put together and I spoke. I said, be clear, if the chancellor tried to exclude these speakers, they and their supporters would sue and they would win. When Auburn University tried to exclude the white supremacist speaker, Richard Spencer, his supporters sued and they won. 
I said, the campus will be liable for the speaker's attorney's fees. I said, the chancellor might be personally liable for money damages because she's violating clearly established law that a reasonable officer should know. I said, nothing would be gained. The speakers would be able to come anyway and they would just be made martyrs. No one applauded when I said that. And yet that is the law under the First Amendment. It's the law that applies to the internet as well. You might remember that uh, two years ago this month, it was in November of 2019, Ann Coulter spoke on campus. And the morning after she spoke, I was shown a video of students and others who were going to hear her being assaulted. They were spit at, water was thrown at them, they were pushed and they were shoved. And after seeing the videotape, I sent a letter to the entire law school community saying that all ideas and views can be expressed on campus. If we don't like what's said, our response should be more speech. That certainly it was acceptable, appropriate to protest against the Coulter, but it's not okay to spit at, throw water at, push and shove those who are going to hear her. And I said, we as a law school have to stand up for free speech. This was not well received by some of my students. On every bulletin board in the law school, it was put up a flyer strongly criticizing me for this. Students came to my office to object. One said that my message defending Ann Coulter's right to speak was like a slap in the face to him. Another said to me that she regards Ann Coulter's presence on campus as violence against her. If you look at the Berkeley Law website today, if you look at the Racial Justice Hub, and if you look at the letter from student affinity group leaders, they criticize me for supporting, quote, the intellectual acceptability of white supremacist views. I don't support the intellectual acceptability of white supremacist views. What this is about was I defended Ann Coulter's right to speak on campus. I would continue to do so because the assumption of the First Amendment is that the only way your speech or my speech will be secure tomorrow is to get the speech that we don't like today. We don't need the First Amendment to safeguard the speech we like. We would let that go on anyway. We need the First Amendment to protect the speech that we detest. Ultimately, the First Amendment, and for that matter, the Communication Decency Act, rests on the premise that we're better off letting all ideas and views be expressed than to let the government pick and choose. Once we let the government exercise power over what's said, then we're at the mercy of whoever's in power in terms of what we're able to see, to hear, to read. And what free speech is all about is distrust of that government power. I think world history shows why we don't want the government to have that authority. The overall assumption of the First Amendment is that more speech is better. It's not always true. If the speech is hateful, more isn't better. If the speech is child pornography, more isn't better. But overall, I think that that assumption is correct, that generally more speech is better. And of course, the internet, the social media bring us more speech than ever before. That's why I refer to our current time as the golden age of free speech. Well, I've talked my 45 minutes. I'm glad now to do questions. Um, so I understand I should just go to the chat and read the questions and do my best to answer them. Florida State just prohibited their faculty from testifying in the hearings on voter laws. Can faculty sue? Um, yes, the University of Florida has prohibited three professors from testifying with regard to the Florida voter law. Um, I think that this is an infringement of their free speech and I think they can sue and I think they'll win, but it's a little bit more complicated. I cannot engage in behavior that is a conflict of interest with my employer. I can't sue the University of California. I can't engage in a business that would compete with something the law school is doing. Um, 
that's a conflict of interest. And I mean, we all know that we're not allowed to have conflicts of interest staff members. The question is, is having these professors testify and express an expert opinion a conflict of interest? I don't think so. Um, I write op-eds all the time. I have one that just came out today and that's just a few minutes ago in the Los Angeles Times about this morning's oral arguments in the Supreme Court. I have written op-eds very critical of the University of California. Um, I think that that's my free speech right. I don't regard my expressing my views as a conflict of interest. I don't think it's the same as suing the university as a lawyer with a conflict of interest. I don't think that it's the same as having a competitive business. But that's the issue. I think this is about speech and I hope the professors sue and I hope they win. From what Dean Chemerinsky has pointed out, it certainly appears that they can and will win too. Yes, I would think they can sue. Um, it says, but they're not. I did not know that they made the choice not to sue to just capitulate. I didn't know that. Without directly, and I don't, I, I, I don't know. Without directly addressing section 230 or attacking free speech, how can the legislature or we citizens in general address internet misinformation and hate speech? Maybe antitrust actions, boycotts, or general sitting and calling out free speech and media exposure pressures since internet social media companies are private companies. Yes, there's the possibility of antitrust actions against the social media companies. That doesn't directly deal with particular instances of misinformation or hate speech, but there are antitrust actions against say Facebook and Google. There can certainly always be a boycott. People are allowed on their own to organize boycotts and that's in itself an exercise of free speech and freedom of association. We can certainly create websites to ch fact check and try to put forth accurate information. Um, the internet companies themselves can engage in choice about what to put up and not put up. Facebook has tried very hard to in recent months take down false information about vaccinations. And Facebook is a private company can make whatever choice it wants as to what goes up or doesn't go up. That's its first amendment rights. But I'll tell you, none of these are very satisfying. None of these seem to get at the root problem of the extent to which misinformation is able to proliferate on the internet and the harms of that misinformation. Um, a group of us here on campus, including the Dean of the Journalism School and a prominent professor in computer science, professor in engineering, are trying to organize, and Janet Palatano is part of it, trying to organize to try to think of what can be done to deal with the misinformation over the internet. Is there a way of reforming Section 230 that doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater? And at this point, I don't have that answer. I have not yet seen a solution to the problem of Section 230 that isn't worse than the problem. The ACU has been vilified by both ends of the political spectrum for actively protecting free speech rights. Yes, and that's not something new. In the late 1970s, early 1980s, the ACLU protected the right of the Nazis to march in Skokie. The ACLU lost nationally one third of its members for doing that. More recently, the ACLU has protected the rights or advocated for the rights of white supremacists to be able to express their message. But that's what the ACLU exists for, is to be an advocate for constitutional rights. And um, so, yes, the ACLU has been vilified for doing this, but I think the ACLU sees it as its mission. And within the ACLU, it's very controversial. There are those within the ACLU that believe that it shouldn't be so aggressive in protecting free speech rights. It should do more to advance equality, even when it means compromising speech. Algorithms like those at Facebook elevate visibility of some idea of speech of others. Can the elevation be regulated in the Constitution? Should it be regulated? I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know the answer to it. I read an op-ed in the New York Times not long ago that focused on this. And the group here on campus is gonna talk a lot about algorithms. Um, the difficulty is that say Facebook or Twitter are private entities. 
they have free speech rights. If the government seeks to regulate their speech, then that violates the First Amendment. And part of their speech rights is choosing what to put up in what order. And that's done by algorithms. To answer your question perhaps more specifically, I think we could require more transparency and disclosure of the algorithms. And part of the PACT Act that I referred to would require more disclosure and transparency of the algorithms. I think the harder question is, if we're gonna do more than transparency, how can the government regulate without violating the First Amendment? Um, the California Law Review gets to decide what to put up first and second and third. The University of California Berkeley Law School on its website gets to decide, why don't Facebook and YouTube get to decide what to display more prominently? And um, so I think that's the, the real question with regard to algorithms, but it's a great question. And um, how, if at all, can they be regulated consistent with the First Amendment? No one's come up with a good answer to that yet, but it's one we need to focus on. Can you please contrast if your free speech approach to Canada's? Yeah, there's much more protection of free speech in the United States than in Canada. Um, just as an example, under English law, in a defamation case, the burden of proof is placed on the defendant to show truth. In the United States, the burden of proof is placed on the plaintiff to prove falsity. Canada has allowed much more regulation of sexually explicit material than the United States. Canada adopted a version of the Catherine McKinnon Andrew Dworkin law that prohibited pornography as a form of sexually explicit subordination of women. In fact, a book by Andrea Dworkin got banned under that. When American cities tried to adopt laws like that, they quickly got struck down. So Canada is much closer to England than it is to the United States in terms of the speech that's allowed and the speech that can be regulated. Recommended reading Robert Bolt's A Man for All Season about standing up for the right of people to hold opposite beliefs from yours. Um, it's a wonderful play. It's the story of Sir Thomas More. Um, great movie as well. Not long ago, as part of a eulogy, I quoted from the book, the play A Man for All Seasons. One of the underpinning assumptions of liberalism, which I include myself in it, is this objective reality that can be held up as a measuring stick for evaluation, comparison, determination. But today's social media participants were not raised that way. They were raised in a post pacoa version of human interaction where power and knowledge not underlaid with fundamental facts. Though people in reality-based communities with pity or contempt, in that situation, there's no misinformation, just winners and losers. It's a wonderful comment. Not sure I can do it justice. I think I'll take it back to where I ended. I think the question is, who do we want to decide what's true or what's false? The assumption of the First Amendment is, it's better to let all ideas and views be expressed. And there's hope that the true ones will survive and the false ones will be refuted. There's no assurance of that. There's times when falsehoods spread. There can be great harm until the falsehoods are weighed by the truth. But the First Amendment, I think, is based on the idea that we don't trust the government to tell us what's true and what's false. And so we don't give the government the power to censor speech that says that vaccines don't work or some of the silly lies about vaccines changing people's chromosomes. The government can't take those off the internet. The government can't punish those. Um, I think therefore that what the First Amendment rests on is this distrust of government power. And that's why we don't give the government that kind of authority. Um, obviously there's true and false thing. I mean, it's not that there's nothing that's true and nothing that's false. I'm sitting in a chair. COVID's killed over 7,000 people in the United States. Greenhouse gases cause climate change. Um, but do we want the government to be there to censor the opposite? 
the Holocaust happened, but we want the government to be able to remove from the internet speech that denies the Holocaust. That's why I say, I think this question is one of government power. And at least under current First Amendment law, the government doesn't have that power. Question, did you say you cannot be fired from being critical of the University of California president? Does this apply to all faculty or staff at the University of California, Berkeley? Um, yes, generally you can't be fired for criticizing the president of the University of California or the provost or the dean or anyone else. Um, that's not to say it's unlimited. If it could be proven that the speech was defamatory, that it was false and you knew it was false and it harmed reputation, you know, there might be a realm of that. But if I were to criticize a choice that Michael Drake has made and he would order me fired, I could sue and I would win. So in general, and then I can get into all the specifics you want, in general, speech critical of government officials is protected by the First Amendment. And I can go into more detail if you want. How does the discussion change if social media, Facebook become public utilities? Well, it would take a state law to make them public utilities. We don't have any national public utilities. So I don't think Congress would do that. Um, but we could make the Facebook, I guess we could make Facebook a public utility in the same way that the electric company or the gas company is a public utility. We could subject it to much greater regulation, but there's all sorts of problems with that. When it comes to the electric company or the gas company, they don't regulate speech. If making Facebook a public utility, still a private company, forces it to regulate speech in some way, well, then you're intruding on Facebook's free speech rights and the like. Also, what do we mean by a public utility? Phone companies are a public utility in the sense that they have to carry anyone who wants to use them. What do we mean by making Facebook a public utility? Or perhaps the best way I can answer is, I don't know that making them a public utility would solve the problem because I don't know that it would give the government any more latitude to regulate because they're still private companies, even if they're deemed public utilities. The public utilities, PG&E, are still private companies. And if it's a private company and its speech is being regulated by the government, there's First Amendment issues. Next question. Who has the constitutional right to regulate certain types of government employee speech? Okay, this is complicated, but I'll go through it quickly. Government employee speech is generally protected if it involves a matter of public concern and if the speech interests outweigh the government's interests in regulation. It's a Supreme Court case called Pickering versus Board of Education from 1968. On the other hand, if the speech is on the job in the scope of one's duties, there's generally not First Amendment protection. That's Supreme Court case Garcetti versus Sabalas in 2006, except the Federal Court of Appeals has said, if it's an exercise of academic freedom, then a government employee's speech is protected by the First Amendment, even if it's on the job in the scope of duties. I realize I've covered about a week of constitutional law on that, but Pickering versus Board of Education involved a high school teacher who went on the radio and was very critical of the school administration and got fired and sued and won. Um, Garcetti versus Sabalas involved the district attorney who wrote a memo to the file that he gave, a prosecutor gave a memo to the file that he gave to a defense lawyer. Um, and the Supreme Court said, well, it's on the job in the scope of duty, you don't get First Amendment protection. But the Ninth Circuit has said, a professor who writes as an exercise of academic freedom can't be fired for his or her speech generally. Glad to go into more detail if you want. Um, as to who has the constitutional right to regulate certain types of government employee speech? Well, the government would initiate the action to discipline the employee, but then the employee could sue and go to court and say free speech was violated. Um, let's see. When the Bush crew coined the phrase reality-based community, they were using that as denigration, not admiration. The reality-based community will fall further and further behind 
I think the Steve Band of this world are pretty confident that holding on to the truth rather than asserting alternative facts vigorously is a losing tactic. I'm not sure what to say. I hope you're wrong. Um, I hope that in the end, um, the truth about vaccinations or climate change with a form of government wins out. But I'm skeptical as to, if not, whether censorship would be able to have truth triumph. Will the Supreme Court kill New York Times versus Sullivan? Okay. Um, in 1964, in New York Times versus Sullivan, the Supreme Court said that the First Amendment protects open and robust debate. It protects even vituperative attacks on public officials. And the Supreme Court made it difficult for a public official to win a defamation action. In order for a public official to win a defamation action, the public official has to prove with clear and convincing evidence the falsity of the statement and actual malice, that the defendant knew the statement was false, acted with reckless disregard of the truth. It makes it very difficult for government officials, the president of the United States, a senator, the governor of California, the chancellor, the dean of a law school to win a defamation action. And the reason for that is the desire to make sure we have open and robust debate about our government, and especially those who hold and run for public office. When New York Times versus Sullivan came down the next day, then now late University of Chicago law professor Harry Calvin said, the decision was an occasion for dancing in the streets. I think it's the most important free speech case ever decided by the Supreme Court. But a couple of years ago, in a case called McKee versus Cosby, Justice Clarence Thomas called it into question. This past spring, both Justice Thomas and Gorsuch called it into question. And it might be that there's a majority of the court to reconsider it. But this goes back to what I said that separates our law from say that in England or Canada. In England or Canada, the defendant has to prove the truth of the statement as a defense of defamation action. It's often hard to prove something to be true. Under New York Times versus Sullivan, the plaintiff in a defamation action has to prove it's false. I think it'd be a huge setback of free speech to overrule New York Times versus Sullivan. Is there a potential distinction between the speech of individuals and regularly intentional manipulation of hate speech in a massive messaging for purpose of profit? I think the question is how to do that. I mean, to start with, how do we define what's hate speech? That's proven elusive in a way that's not unduly vague or overbroad. What do we mean by massive messaging for purpose of profit? The New York Times is, I think, the best-selling circulating newspaper, about 8 million subscribers. Is that massive messaging for purpose of profit? I don't think it engages in hate speech, um, but it's not speech of individuals. Um, but the answer is we haven't found a way to distinguish between speech of individuals on one hand and speech of entities on the other. And even if we did, are postings on Facebook speech of individuals or is it massive messaging for purposes of profit? It's one thing for me to post something on social media. If somebody has a million followers, is that massive messaging for purposes of profit? Um, so under current law, no such distinction is drawn. Um, I think it would be hard to draw a distinction between individual speech and mass speech. And of course, we don't wanna say that speech gets less protection, the more people it reaches, the more effective it is. Um, a private individual cannot yell fire where there's no fire in a crowded theater. Are you saying a private company can do the equivalent? Well, there's no right to falsely shot fire in a crowded theater. In, in First Amendment law, this is the doctrine of incitement. You can't incite illegal activity, but incitement is a colloquial term. It is a legal test. The legal test is 
that the speech can be punished if there's a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity and if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. It's a very difficult test to meet. If it's met, the speech can be punished. I think the question would be, what do we mean by saying falsely yelling fire in a crowded theater? Is saying that vaccines don't work the equivalent of falsely yelling fire in a crowded theater? Was the lies about January, about the, the November election that led to the January 6th insurrection, falsely fire in a crowded theater? How far do we want to give the government the power to censor that which some believe to be false? Um, and do we want the government to have that kind of authority? If that false alarm was a result of a group of people in the theater responding to the intentional manipulation, then I think, yes. Um, I'm trying to think of how, how to respond. Um, I think it comes down to what do we mean by intentional manipulation? How are we gonna define intentional manipulation? If somebody says vaccines don't work and they attract a huge number of Facebook and Twitter followers, is that intentional manipulation? They're wrong or is the best solution for people to explain why vaccinations do work? Or as another example, um, if someone to deny the Holocaust, um, should we say that's intentional manipulation and we can stop them? Or do we say that the appropriate thing to do is to allow responses? Now, I wanna keep in mind here, Facebook and Twitter and Google and YouTube do engage in content moderation of their own. Since they're private, they can do that. And they take down huge amounts of information. The reality though, is they just can't keep up with the quantity that's there. If the hateful message is a result of algorithms, isn't that a business model? But isn't everything the New York Times chooses to put in its headlines also a business model? Gosh, isn't what we choose to put on our website of Berkeley Law in a sense of business model? And then we're trying to attract students to come here and attract donors to give to us. The fact that there is a motive to, even a profit motive in some instances, that, that can't be enough. I mean, Book publishers do everything they can to sell their books. The profit motive doesn't mean it's less protected by the First Amendment. What are thoughts about the current Supreme Court and the Texas abortion law? Um, I mentioned, I just finished and it's, it's online right now in the LA Times. Um, we still have a couple of minutes. Um, there's no doubt that the Texas abortion law is blatantly unconstitutional. It prohibits abortions at about the sixth week of pregnancy when Roe versus Wade says abortions can't be prohibited until viability, which is about the 24th week of pregnancy. The Texas law is unusual because it's not enforced by the attorney general or district attorneys in Texas. It's enforced by civil suits. And the issue that was argued this morning in the Supreme Court in Whole Woman's Health versus Jackson is, can you still sue state officials even if they're not the ones enforcing the law. And I think the Supreme Court is gonna say yes, because an unconstitutional law has to be able to be challenged in federal court. The other case is United States versus Texas. Can the United States government sue to have an unconstitutional law invalidated? And I was less sure based on the oral arguments where the justice will come out. Last question, if you can't be fired for criticizing the chancellor, why can a Tesla employee be fired for criticizing Elon Musk? It goes to what I said. The First Amendment applies to the government. It doesn't apply to a private company. So since I work for the government, it's limited in firing me for my speech. But Tesla is a private company and it can fire its employees for their speech. The First Amendment limits what the government can do. It doesn't limit what private companies can do. I think I've come to my time, which is 3.15. Thank you for the wonderful questions.